Okay, so what I thought of telling you today, going a bit through the historical development of, uh, uh, of this story is, first of all, my question, which is, where is the complexity of the human, or in any case, or eukaryotic genome, where is the complexity of the organism stored in the genome? Uh, I will make a, a short detour on protein structure prediction just because I use that for the subsequent step. And I will tell you some results that we had when we analyzed uh, uh, the results of an international project called, the G, G, uh, called ENCODE. And then what we did was to take what we had done on the ENCODE results and, uh, uh, and expand that to the whole genome. Uh, and I will try to convince you that we found a couple of surprising things. So the first, the question is simple. Uh, we seem to have something between 20 and 25,000 protein coding genes. I think the present number is 23,000. It keeps changing, so I'm, I'm not really sure about it. Um, and I, I, I don't know whether it's more puzzling that this number is so ill-defined or whether it's even more surprising that there are so few. We like to think that we are very complex organisms, that we are more complex than a sea urchin, which has 20,000 genes. So this, this created some uh, psychological problems in the human. Uh, but she didn't have many already. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. I don't know what the sea urchin thinks. Perhaps they are there saying, well, yeah, of course you, you don't need so many genes to be a human, right? So one of the things that is usually was usually used to justify this uh, complexity is that, in fact, the genome is a very complex uh, 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 structure and that uh, there, there, is, there are mechanisms like splicing, but there are also mechanisms such as alternative splicing. So as you all know, genes are not contiguous on the DNA sequence and they get, uh, and the various exon gets uh, combined to produce an mRNA, which then can code for a protein, but there are also mechanisms by which, uh, from the same gene, you can get different mRNA transcripts and different proteins. And the first question is, how do this protein work from, from a functional and structural point of view? Uh, when I was young and I was in San Francisco, there was this theory, uh, this was the very beginning of the old story, there was this theory that exon should correspond to domains in proteins, and this would explain everything. Some of my colleagues keep telling that to students, but no, uh, uh, exons do not correspond to domains. That's for sure. There are three or four cases I could find where exons exactly correspond to domains, but they are the exception rather than the rule. So at that point, when we were wondering what was happening uh, in the in the genome in terms of alternative, in the structure of the proteins as a consequence of alternative splicing, what happened was that the so-called uh, first draft of the human genome had, be com had been completed or was claimed to be completed. And at the same time, a worldwide effort started called ENCODE where they selected 1% of the genome and went to analyze carefully what was happening in that 1%. And so they looked at all the transcripts and a number of other details of this 1%. At the time, we were part of a, a, a European project called Biosapiens, which was meant to annotate the human genome. And uh, we decided to look at the results of ENCODE and try to understand whether it was true that alternative splicing could be the explanation of this lack of correlation between what we like to think is the number of our functions and the number of our genes. There is this rumor around that we have about 100,000 function. I could never find any reason, any evidence where that number comes from, but it's the number that everybody mentions. Okay, so we said, okay, what we want to do then is to go and look at the structure of the alternative spliced isoforms of a gene and see how, how does alternative splicing uh, affect the structure and the function of the protein. And, uh, in my past life, what I was interested in was in methods to go from the sequence of a protein to the structure of the protein, what is called protein structure prediction. And uh, uh, although, as you all know, 
the folding of a protein happens in a very crowded environment, is often all helped by other uh, proteins which facilitate the process, we also know that this is in fact a spontaneous process. And that uh, uh, the reason this process happens is because there is a, the, 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 the delta G of this process, the difference in free energy between the unfolded chain and the folded chain is negative. And this means that the interactions that you observe in the final protein structure compensate the favorable energetic uh, contributions of these interactions are able to um, compensate for the large loss of entropy that the protein undergoes when it goes from a completely unfolded chain to a folded chain. Okay, oh, sorry. Okay, all right. So, we know since the 1968, in fact, when 61 was proven again, proven again from the Amphinson famous experiment, that the, the information about the structure of a protein is in its sequence. We also know that the structure of proteins is conserved through evolution. In other words, if two proteins come from the same progenitor, if they are homologous, their structure is very is similar, and the similarity depends on how far away they are uh, along the evolutionary uh, tree. And that we can detect that two proteins are homologous by looking at their uh, similarity in sequence. So we can say that similar sequences give rise to similar structure. I could spend a couple of hours discussing this slide with you. Uh, in fact, what we know from the physics of the proteins and from the mechanism of evolution is that throughout evolution, mutations are accommodated inside the structure, trying to perturb the structure as little as possible because there is an evolutionary pressure. But regardless of the reasons for all this, what we know is that if we have two homologous proteins, and if we know the structure of one, this can represent a very good approximation of the structure of the other. And how good the approximation is depends on how far away evolutionarily these proteins are. So we have uh, tools to predict, as we say, the structure of a protein. You come to me with the sequence of a protein. I look for a, a, a protein homologous to yours, which is of known structure, of experimentally known structure. So if I can detect that they're homologous, I can use the structure of one as a approximation of the structure of the other. This is all there is in what is called comparative modeling. There are a lot of sophistication in the, in the various steps, but the, the basic concept is this one, right? So this means that now we can go and look at the results of the ENCODE uh, experiment, take these proteins and their alternative spliced isoforms, predict their structure, and see what happens. And um, for example, this is one example. There are cases where in, there are two different isoforms of the same protein in, in our genome. Uh, in one isoform, the green exon is included. In the other isoform, the red exon is included. From the point of view of the sequence, this means that this sequence is replaced by this other sequence in the second isoform. If you look at the structure now, you can map where this region falls into the structure, and you see that it falls in this region, and you uh, can, can understand that because this is near the active site of the protein, the fact that this sequence is different in the two isoforms allows the protein to have a different affinity, the two isoforms to have different affinity for the substrate. And so according to which affinity you need, you can make this isoform or this other isoform, and this all makes sense, okay? What makes a bit less sense is this other example. This is the human uh, hemoglobin delta subunit, and there are two isoforms. One includes four exons, the other one includes two exons. And the second isoform misses all this uh, reddish part, and it's completely non-obvious what is this protein doing when it's missing all this part? What is certainly not binding the heme, certainly not carrying oxygen anywhere, might be doing something completely different. But the, what, what is even more surprising is that this is not the exception, it's rather the rule. In other words, if you look at the, at the ENCODE results, more than 30% of the cases you find 
examples of proteins which are not like my first example. So small modulations of the structure and function of one of the isoforms. But they are completely different. And they miss important pieces. They, for example, look at this case. If you miss this reddish thing here, the protein cannot maintain the same topology. There is no way you can connect this point with this point. So this region has to fold differently to do something different. But does it really do something different? I mean, is really a, a functional protein? How do we know? As you uh, are aware, I assume, it's, very, it, it's possible to demonstrate that something, something exists. It's much more difficult to demonstrate that something does not exist. So if I want to know whether this isoform exists, what do I do? I mean, I look for the isoform, but in which cell type, at which stage of development, in which moment of the cell life, Okay, so at this point we wondered whether we could expand this analysis not only to the 1% of the human genome but to the whole human genome and try to derive some sensible uh, idea about what was happening. So as I told you, we have ways to predict, as we say, it should be, the, the word should be infer, but we use prediction we like that. So. Uh, there are a number of tools to predict the structure of your protein biomology. And the way they work is that you give the sequence of the protein to the server. You, you usually type it in somewhere. Uh, the, the system goes, looks for homologous proteins of known structure, finds what is the optimal correspondence of the residues, and comes back with the model. And this is what everything does. We have developed the tool that does the following. When you come with your sequence, we don't believe you. We go back to the genome. We collect every possible isoform of that protein, and we model all of these isoforms. And then we try to see whether they make sense or not. Now, what does it mean, make sense? Uh, you look at the structure of a protein. Is that OK or not? Uh, it's very difficult to say, of course. What we can tell you is whether or not the structure of the isoform follows the same rules that we have observed over and over again in all the proteins that we know. For example, we know that proteins don't have very large hydrophobic exposed residues uh, regions. We know that they are usually well packed. We know that some amino acids interact with each other more favorably than others. And so we can take the models of the various isoforms and uh, assess how well they fit with what we are used to see in terms of protein structures. Okay? This is not to say they, they cannot exist, but they don't look like what we are used to see. Okay. Another thing that proteins tend to do is to be formed by functional domains. There are domains that perform specific function. They are limited in some region of the sequence. There are databases, the most famous of one being PFAM, which stores a statistical models for different functional domains. And these are based on either Markov models and are a very efficient way to identify domains, functional domains within proteins. And if you look at real proteins, the proteins we know exist because we know the structure, the function, everything, uh, it's very rare that you find interrupted domains. In other words, either the domain is not there or is completely there. For example, if you look at all the proteins of known structure, almost more than 90% of them have either the old domain or nothing. So this is another hint that you can have to understand whether one of these isoforms that we are looking for is behaving like other proteins. Okay, then we reasoned in the following way. There are a lot of proteomic experiments, and as you know better than me, what proteomics experiments can do is detect small peptides which might or might not map to a specific protein. So suppose that you have a gene with three different isoforms. Now you go and look at every single proteomic experiment ever done in the universe. And you wonder whether anybody ever found a peptide that specifically says, 
specifically maps to this axon. If this is the case, then there is at least one situation in which this isoform is translated, okay? If you don't find it, because the coverage of mass spectrometry experiment is not very high, if you don't find it, you cannot say the isoform does not exist. You can say, I could not verify the existence of this isoform. Is that clear? Hmm? So, now we have two sets of data. We have the sets of, from the same genes. We have some isoforms that we know exist, and some, some isoforms that we cannot prove they exist. And now we ask ourselves, are they different? in terms of structural, what we call structural plausibility, in the sense that I explained to you before, and in terms of completeness of their functional domain. So if you take normal genes, genes without, no, there are, there's no such a thing as a normal gene, but genes that do not undergo alternative splicing, and that we have, we have and the translation of which has been seen by proteomics experiment, then the large majority of them, more than 90%, either have a plausible structure or uninterrupted functional domains or both. And only less than 10% behave strangely, in quotes. So either have some structure that has some strange properties compared to what we are used to see, or they have some interrupted domain. Now we look at genes which are uh, which have more than one isoform, and that we know they are translated because we have observed specific peptides mapping to them in, a, in a proteomics experiment. And once again, the large majority, more than 90% of them, have uh, either a plausible structure or non-interrupted PFAM domains or both. Now what happens to our unverified isoforms, the ones that we have no idea whether they exist or not. And here the picture changes radically. More than half of them do not have what we call a plausible structure or have interrupted PFAM domain or both. Okay, so of course this is not enough to say these isoforms are not translated into functional protein. But it's enough to say these isoforms do not make proteins that they have a function that is a modification of the, of the other isoform function. It's not a modulation of function. It's either something completely different, or perhaps these proteins, or these genes, these mRNAs, are not trans translated at all. Of course, we have eliminated all the uh, 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 nonsense mediated decay and everything else. Okay. A few more information about these strange isoforms. They are less conserved across mammalian species, for example. If you look at the, num the variations that we uh, observe, for example, in the 1,000 human genomes that are being sequenced right, right now, or in all the other databases of polymorphism, usually you, usually these uh, unverified isoforms have many more missense uh, mutations than the verified isoform, as if they were under less selective pressure for their translation. Again, this is all hints because we have no way to guarantee that some of this does not exist. They are slightly less expressed. I mean, they, they, are, uh, they have a lower level of expression than, uh, than the verified isoforms, and they have some uh, higher level of aggregation propensity. Now, all this is all circumstantial evidence, but the, the, the final part of this part of the story is that more than half of them Either they encode products that are non-functional in, in the classical sense. In other words, they are non-functional proteins or they are something else, or they perform a significantly different function. And which can this function be? Well, they can be coded, coding just simply for RNA. So the RNA might be the function rather than the translated RNA, of course. They can make funny proteins, not complete proteins, which can interfere with the function of other proteins. 
they can be evolutionary reservoirs. So you transcribe and perhaps sometimes they become useful, sometimes they, not, they don't. Or they can be aberrant events, or they can be something that we have no idea what they are. I find it a bit difficult to imagine that half of the isoform have to assume a completely different structure and function with all this genome that we have. That it's not really obvious why that should be the case, but it cannot be excluded. But this first question here, can they be doing something as RNAs rather than as proteins, led us to start investigating RNA. And uh, we started looking whether, for example, in these isoforms there were more uh, RNA, more uh, genes coding for microRNAs, for example, or uh, pyRNAs and stuff like that. Okay. And in doing this, we started exploring the world of RNA. And so I will now go to a different story, which came, came out from the analysis of the RNA, although not exactly in the alternative splice isoforms. You all know how microRNA work. Uh, and they are able to, the my, my specific microRNA are able to bind to the three prime, sometimes not only the three prime, of, of genes, and they can either inhibit the translation or lead to uh, uh, mRNA decay. And while we were looking for microRNA, RNAs in general, we bumped into a very interesting case. And this is the story, the second part of the story I want to tell you today. And this is the, story, the, the, the interesting case. This is uh, a long non-coding RNA. Uh, it, has, it codes for two microRNAs, which I indicate here with the two green bars, which is fine. The problem comes from the fact that when we were looking at this long non-coding, when we look at, at, at the RNA in general, the first thing we do is to look at conserved regions inside these uh, molecules, because that's the only way we have to understand which regions of the molecules are functional or not. So we look at this, uh, at this part, well, we looked at a, a number of long non-coding, but in particular in this one, what we observed in, in this plot, the black bars indicate conservation in mammalian genomes. So when you see this uh, black uh, uh, peak here, it means this region is very well conserved among all mammalian, across all mammalian species. And obviously, the region that encodes for the microRNA are very well conserved, and that's what you expect. But there are these other regions here which are puzzling. What, what are they doing? So we started investigating. And the first thing is, what, what is this, link, this long non-coding doing? Well, it, it is uh, expressed during myoblast differentiation. We started a collaboration at that point with Irene Bozzoni, who was interested in this long non-coding and was working on muscle differentiation. And you can see that the long non-coding is um, expressed in differentiating. Myoblast is... Uh, is only expressed in, in muscle and no other tissue. And obviously, when you overexpress, when, when the, the long non coding increases its expression, the encoded mirror also increases their expression. And this is all normal, right? And uh, it, the in, increase in the expression level of this long non coding parallels what happens for the differentiation markers in muscle cells. And uh, uh, there, are, there are a number of experiments done by Irene uh, in, in Irene's lab to demonstrate that the, uh, the level of uh, the increasing in the level of, um, of the long non coding leads to differentiation even if you mutate it so that the two microRNA are not expressed anymore. So it's independent on the microRNA. But we had these conserved regions, and we looked uh, what could be happening in those conserved regions outside of the microRNA uh, coding part. And I, I, can, I can lie to you and say, and then we found that there were two microRNAs which could target these regions on the uh, long non-coding. In fact, we found 
hundreds of microRNAs that, in principle, could bind there. But these two, in particular, microRNA 135 and 133, were known to be expressed in muscle. So we discarded all the others. Then we discarded all the microRNAs. Uh, no, so we discarded all the microRNAs that were not uh, expressed in muscle, and we were left with these two. You know that finding the targets of microRNAs is like throwing a coin, essentially, because the, the level of, uh, of sensitivity, uh, no, the level of specificity of the method is extremely low. But with the trick of eliminating anything that doesn't look like muscle, uh, this sort of worked. Right, so the next question is, which are the real, these microRNAs, what would they do in their life? I mean, what's their role in life? And um, we, again, we looked for putative targets of this microRNA. Of course, we found billions. We eliminated everything which was not muscle specific. And we ended up with MAML1 and MF2C, which are two transcription factors that are known to be muscle transcription factors. OK, so this is, uh, this, this is the experiment which demonstrate, demonstrates that MIR-135 and uh, MIR-133 target MAML1 and MEV2C. So far, nothing particularly surprising. Now, here is what happens if you start playing a bit with the long known coding and the microRNA. So here, there is no microRNA, no long known coding. Everything is fine. MAML1 is expressed as expected because you don't have the microRNA. So the level of MAML1 and MEV2C increases. Now, you remove the long known coding, and as expect, and you, you have the microRNA. And what happens is that the level of MAML1 and MF2C goes down, as expected, because they are targets of the two microRNA. Now, you remove, by uh, silencing an LNA, you remove both the microRNA and the long known coding, and the level of the two genes remain the same, as expected. However, if now you have both the microRNA and the long known coding, what happens is that the microRNAs bind to the long known coding, do not bind to MAML1 and MF2C, and so MAML1 and MF2C are expressed even in the presence of the microRNAs. Okay. So in practice, the model is as follows. You have MEF2C and MAML1, which are two transcription factors. When they go to the nucleus, they activate muscle genes, and this leads to differentiation. And the microRNAs are there and control the expression of MEF2C and MAML1, so as long as the two microRNAs are there, MAML1 and MEF2C do not go to the nucleus, the muscle does not differentiate. If now you add the long known coding, the microRNAs are sequestered by the long known coding, and MAML1 and MEF2C can translocate to the nucleus, they can bind to their uh, binding site to muscle genes, and the muscle genes get expressed and the cell differentiate. Furthermore, if you look at a, a model of uh, Duchenne uh, syndrome, which is a, 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 which has a, a, which is a, a disease which, that has to do with, la, la, with missing differentiation of the muscle, you see that, where is it? You see that uh, the, the long known coding is much less expressed in uh, Duchenne cells uh, with respect to normal cells, also in human. So here we are. This is a completely new, well, almost completely new. It has been observed in, in plants, and I, I think ages ago, but nobody ever went through the whole story. But this is a new mechanism by which you can have a, a, an even an, another layer of control of the expression. So you have the transcription factors and the transcription factor binding sites. Then you have the microRNA that can control the transcription factor. Now you have the long known coding that controls 
the microRNA that control the transcription factor. And this is quite, uh, you know, puzzling. So if you, if you think about it, you have protein coding genes, which can be transcription factors, and that are controlled by transcription factors. MicroRNA that can control protein coding genes, but they can also control transcription factor, which in turn, in turn control protein coding genes. And now long known coding RNA, which control how microRNA control everything. And perhaps you have a number of other things that sooner or later we will discover. So my initial question is, uh, how come we, are, we have so few genes and we are so complex? Starts, I, I'm, I'm starting to think, do we really need all this complexity? I mean, it seems like the encoded complexity is even more than we need. And it, it, it is tempting to try to understand why there is this other layer of, of, uh, of control. You can imagine all sorts of things. Uh, it can be a matter of robustness. It's a bit what happens when you have uh, a transcription factor controlling both a gene and a transcription factor that controls the same gene. This is a, a typical motif that you find in, in uh, regulatory networks and is done to avoid spikes. To avoid that spikes in the, in the expression level would lead to the activation of a gene. So maybe something like this. Maybe a patch of evolution when, you know, at one point didn't know how to get rid of this microRNA. It can be something else we don't know. The only thing we know is that it's not a unique case because we recently, I don't have the data yet, but recently we, we did uh, deep sequencing of the long known coding RNAs in muscle cells before and after differentiation, and we looked for differentially expressed long known coding, and we found at least 40, 30, 40 candidates uh, that changed their expression level during, uh, during muscle differentiation, and we, are, we don't know yet whether they parallel the expression of microRNAs somewhere. We have done the, in parallel the experiment with the microRNAs, but we have not compared the data yet. So, as I said, you know, I started by saying that proteins were complex and uh, DNA or RNA was boring. I don't think this is boring at all. Uh, the last thing I want to say is uh, that uh, uh, this, has been, th this work has been done in collaboration mainly with Irene Bozzoni, with the group of Irene Bozzoni. And the people in my group who did all the work are Mauro Ginappi, who is an aerospatial engineer, I think, something like that. Not really <coughs> sure. Luigi Grassi is a, a, a biologist, uh, Loredana is a physicist, and Guido is a chemist. And I think that we have learned uh, by, by by putting together all these expertise and all these different ways of looking at things, we have learned to look at problems in, I, I don't know if it's a very effective way, but it's certainly a lot of fun to have all these people discussing about uh, a, a complex biological argument with so many different points of view that every once in a while we have to stop and say, okay, we we'll start again tomorrow because the discussion is going in, in, in directions that we cannot control anymore. And this is true for all my group. They, they, they come from essentially every possible branch of science. I'm, I'm still looking for a philosopher because I think that would uh, uh, help increasing the diversity of the group. And the last thing is that, that I wanted to say is I wanted to thank you very much for your attention and any question you want to ask.